think I want to call this um, complex exponentials overview. So this is a topic that I really want to give a three month as a part of a lecture because it's the kind of thing that um, does get covered in math classes leading up to here. But both of these ideas, uh, both the idea of complex numbers and the idea of complex exponentials, um, they, I, I find that they don't get enough, uh, enough proper emphasis in a math class. It's uh, the kind of thing that we can really only properly cover with the uh, right kind of emphasis and the, with the real applications you see in the real world. In a, uh, that kind of coverage is really only possible in a physics class or an engineering class. So I want you to give this overview. I know I've done this uh, before. This is my second attempt at it, uh, kind of trying to, uh, I don't know, do it a little bit more <laughs> shortly and maybe uh, don't forget important things. Uh, let me point out some things that I think it's good for everyone to be aware of. So this comes out of a question maybe about a year ago. One of the students in my physics 4B was asking for a written material covering this. I think he didn't want to watch it through, or you know, he watched it through the lecture videos. And um, as I say often, it's beneficial for you to see different treatments. Uh, if my lecture doesn't fully make sense, then I do want you to have written materials. And it this is the sort of thing that lower division physics textbooks don't cover all that fully. And I think a lot of upper division textbooks assume that you are familiar with it. And it was a bit of a struggle to find the right um, written content. The one resource that I found that should be accessible at your level while covering the sophisticated ideas is uh, Feynman Lectures. So let me just uh, show it to you here. Um, so Feynman Lectures, it's available on Caltech website. It didn't used to be this way, but you can read it for free. And I think the content I'm looking for is both in volume one and volume two. So within volume one, it's uh, covered under algebra, very deceptive title. But I think this board the picture tells you what he'll be covering. And um, it's a really comprehensive, uh, comprehensive? It's a coverage of the mathematical ideas that I think you're already familiar with. But the, the level and depth of uh, conceptual coverage that you can get now, you know, now that you've taken calculus, you have a degree of mathematical maturity that maybe you didn't have way back when you were learning arithmetic. Um, this is a good kind of good overview for you to see, to see uh, with a more mature view towards algebraic operations that you've learned what kind of significance is there and how to generalize um, known operation into so far unknown domains. I would encourage everyone to uh, reading through this chapter. It's uh, as this is a special message from uh, Ralph Layton. I think he was uh, someone who was lecturing with uh, Feynman at the time. Um, it's uh, it's, uh, um, it's uh, one word, it's amazing. <laughs> you start out with a simple counting and end up with Euler's formula, the most remarkable and useful relationship um, relating relating um, different uh, mathematical objects together. Yeah. So what I hope to do in the next uh, uh, next uh, 10 minutes or so, it's not a replication of what, what you see in Feynman Lecture. For that, I will leave that up for you to read the Feynman Lecture. Uh, what I want to give you here is a, a practical application and overview. So um, we should start out with uh, an overview of complex numbers. You learn about complex numbers first in an algebra class because the place where they come from is in attempt to solve algebraic equations, um, polynomial equations like this. Uh, x squared plus one is equal to zero. And the uh, 
kind of the typical algebra question is find the root of this uh, equation or the solutions to this equation. And um, when you go through the manipulation of symbols and try to solve, what you end up with is this uh, expression, x is equal to square root of minus one. And this is the kind of number that um, if you're thinking of real numbers only, you know, numbers that you think of by starting from counting one, two, three, and thinking of fractions and thinking of uh, fractions that can be uh, thinking of things that can be approximated with decimal representation. Um, here, what you're looking for is a number such that when you square it, you get a minus one. And that's not a number that fits within our paradigm. So when mathematicians faced this question, they had to come up with a new kind of number. So the new kind of number that they came up with was given a symbol i, standing for imaginary number. And I think sometimes people get misled by this uh, adjective of imaginary number. You know, as in imaginary numbers are not real, um, <laughs> but it's a uh, there are very real uses of the imaginary number in physics and engineering. And that's uh, what I hope to show here. Let me remind you of a couple of things that you have seen as you are being introduced to, to complex numbers. So you will have seen uh, this representation of complex number. So a complex number G can be expressed as A plus a real part um, added to an imaginary number times the imaginary part. This would be one very natural way to express um, complex number. And um, I don't know which step you go to next, uh, whether you introduce complex plane next or you introduce the polar representation next. I, I think from my perspective, it's more natural to introduce the complex plane next. Because here's the interesting thing about complex numbers. So we are used to numbers like uh, this x here, being having a one uh, degree of freedom, as in you pick a number and that choice of a number um, completely determines the number. But when you look at a complex number like z, it has two degrees of freedom. It has, you can determine, you can specify the real part independently of the imaginary part. These two things can be picked from a head, like without regard to the other. So, so th these have uh, two degrees of freedom. And if you are thinking of other mathematical objects that have um, two degrees of freedom. I, I hope it doesn't take you too long to um, think of vectors, vectors in two dimensional space. And in fact, that's what complex plane represents. So when you represent a complex number on a complex plane, you, you have two axes that you know, span the plane. And one of the axes you associate it with a real component. The other axis you associate with the imaginary component. And any point uh, in this plane can be characterized with the real part and the imaginary part. And um, so this point here, if we are imagining or if we are using this uh, uh, complex number, the real part would be A and the imaginary part would be B. And so we can choose to represent this uh, complex number by these coordinates A and B in the complex plane. And once we start drawing this uh, comparison to geometric representation of vectors, then you can see other ways of representing this mathematical object. So if you're thinking of this like a vector, so what we have here could be described as the Cartesian representation. 
it's uh, describing the the uh, the magnitude and direction of the vector by specifying their x and y coordinates. That's one way to do it. That's how we uh, very often dealt with the vectors. Now, we, if what you're interested in is magnitude and direction, <laughs> then you could specify that magnitude and direction just uh, directly the way you would do in the polar representation of vectors. And I guess if you are thinking in terms of um, analogy between two-dimensional vectors and com uh, complex numbers, we can go as far as this. We can say, oh, this theta, it looks a lot like the angle that we define this way. Uh, tangent of theta is the rise over the run or in opposite over adjacent or a over b and the the magnitude r looking at the geometry we could say r is equal to um, uh, uh, square root of a squared plus b squared and remember a and b are both real numbers because i have this i separated out here and um, you could describe the polar representation this way and um, there's nothing, there would be nothing wrong with it. Um, at the same time, I guess uh, it might feel like we didn't really gain much. We just uh, turned on um, algebra problem, which would describe these uh, solution to polynomials and this uh, way of describing um, uh, com complex numbers. We just uh, introduced some geometric idea and uh, we don't really get any payoff. We don't get any simplification of any calculations we might have done. Because, uh, you know, these formulas are kind of complex, <laughs> complicated looking formula. So, so if you're just stopping here, then, um, then, then, you know, it, it's hard to see what we gain from this. And this is where what you learn in pre-calculus comes in very useful, which is uh, what's described as Euler's equation. And Euler's equation says that exponential of an imaginary number, in i times some parameter x, can be written out this way. Cosine of x, which you know how to calculate, just real value the function plus i times sine of x, another real value the function. This quantity on the left hand side is something that if you are seeing it for the first time, you might wonder what it means. Uh, we know what exponential of uh, real value the parameter is like. So, you know, if we have uh, exponential of x, it looks something like this. Um, when people talk about something is exponentially increasing, this kind of increase is what they're talking about. It bothers me when people talk about parabola is exponentially increasing. Um, so with the real value of the functions of, exp uh, uh, functions of exponential, you know what they look like. But here, you are not looking at a real value of the function of exponential. You are looking at a uh, imaginary uh, value of the parameter going into exponential. And really the way to make a sense of that, it's uh, the tool for that is given in your last semester of calculus, calculus two or math 3b. Um, you are introduced to Taylor expansion polynomials. And that's uh, how you can make a sense of this, uh, uh, this formula here. Let me demonstrate briefly using Sage Math. Okay, let me um, show you some Taylor polynomials. Let's say I'm going to define a function f uh, as a function of x. I think x is predefined. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I did it this wrong. Um, sorry, <laughs> I should have defined f as cosine of x. Okay, and um, so that's the function. And I think there's a Taylor series? Yeah, okay. Taylor 
So, um, so f Taylor um, itself x um, zero uh, to the eighth degree for cosine. Ah, there it is. Okay, I want you to read this kind of backward. So I have one minus one half x squared plus one twenty fourth x to the fourth power, and so on. This is the Taylor approximation of cosine. Let me define a new function g as sine of x, and take the Taylor um, expansion of it to the seventh degree. I think that will give me the same number of terms. Uh, terms as before uh, with the cosine. So I have x minus 1 over 6 x to the third power plus 1 over 120 x to the fifth power minus 1 over 50 40 x to the seventh power and so on. Now let me get a new function h which is an exponential of g and let me take the Taylor expansion of this function of g about 0 and let me do it to eighth order. And when I do that, I hope this is what you can see. There's a kind of a similarity that you can match up these terms. One to one, the one half g squared to minus one half x squared, and, and so on. Uh, you can, for each one of the terms that you see here, one through eighth or zero through eighth order term, you can match them up to either cosine or sine's uh, Taylor expansion. And this uh, Taylor expansion is how you can draw an equality between these two terms. So you can say, um, so if I make this a substitution, I'm going to take this expression and substitute g as um, imaginary number times x. And uh, wait equals and let me see what it does i think i want to kind of full simplify it because i think if i do full simplify it'll kind of factor things out um well it didn't <laughs> but okay uh you you can you can um make this a useful comparison look at all the terms that those that don't have imaginary number i. That's because they come in uh, even powers of g. So when you take even power of imaginary number i, then you can either get plus or minus one, but you won't have i. All those terms, all those real terms, they match up to terms in cosine of x. All the terms that have an imaginary number, because they have all the power of x, or all the part of g, they match up to these uh, terms in the exp expansion of sine of x. So this uh, Taylor expansion is what justifies this formula that exponential of i x is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x. Once we introduce this, it gives you a wonderful simplification of the um, of the, some of the mathematical operations that you might do with complex numbers. Let me give you some examples. Let's imagine that, let's imagine a scenario where we know the complex number, its magnitude and the angle theta. And we want to express the x and the y component of that or the real and the imaginary component of that complex number, then what we would say is that the real component drawing on this geometry should look like um, r times cosine of theta, and the imaginary component should look like r times sine of theta. Seems simple enough. And leaning on this uh, expression for, uh, for complex numbers, we can express this complex number in this form. R times, and this uh, cosine and sine term, instead of writing them out separately, we can write them out this way. 
um, exponential of i theta. Notice how when you look at this expression for complex number in terms of the magnitude and direction, you still need two degrees of freedom. You need the magnitude and direction. And this expression, so it has the same number of degree of freedom as um, the original Cartesian representation. But this particular form has a number of benefits. So as an example, imagine you wanted to calculate the magnitude r. So you could imagine calculating r as a squared plus b squared. I mean, you know, you uh, you just uh, you can do r as okay. I need to take the real component of g square it plus imaginary component of g squared square root it. Um, that's certainly one way to do it, but it's a very cumbersome way to do it. It, it because it's uh, basically doing all the geometry calculations, and uh, it would be nice if there's a clean quick algebraic way to treat it. And this is where I would introduce the idea of complex conjugate. So complex conjugate, which might be rep expressed as complex number notated with an asterisk, is, is a num another complex that number that you get from a complex number. So this would be obtained by taking a complex number g and you replace all instances of i with minus i. Or if you have any uh, complex variables within your expression, each complex variable would acquire this asterisk. So in an expression like this, both a and b are real. So you know, g is equal to a plus ib. This complex conjugate is a minus ib, a and b both being real quantities. You might ask, why are we defining this? What use is this? Uh, the use, it turns out, is to write some mathematical expressions in a very, mathematical operations in a very compact way. So let me just do this calculation. I, no one can stop me from just doing this a little bit of algebra of taking the complex number and multiplying it with its complex conjugate. I can just do it for fun. That's equal to a plus ib times a minus ib. Okay, let me just uh, do the expansion. a times a, a squared a times minus ib minus i a b i b times a plus i the order doesn't matter so it's a b and plus i b times minus i b so it's minus i squared b squared now so let me just write that in first minus i squared b squared now this uh, i squared is equal to minus one so i can cancel this minus with this you get plus b squared. So you get, when you do this calculation, a squared plus b squared, we're looking at this expression here, should be equal to r squared. So here, notice how I'm obtaining the magnitude r without needing to explicitly separate out real and imaginary part. So this multiplication of um, a complex number with its conjugate is giving me a quantity that doesn't depend on the angle theta and depends only on the magnitude r. And here's the amazing thing. Uh, let me do this calculation using the polar representation. Because, uh, you know, if this is just uh, some funny way to do it that happens to work in Cartesian representation, great, that's interesting. But again, what use is it? Well, the use this is, is this complex conjugation, uh, complex conjugation um, 
operation, it's a representation independent. The results that are true, as, such as this product is equal to R squared, that will turn out to be the case whether you carry out the calculation in the Cartesian representation or if you carry out the calculation in the polar representation. So let me do this calculation again in the polar representation. So this whole thing is equal to, oh, wait, wait, uh, sorry, wait, that's not equal to, let me, using the polar representation to this calculation, g times g complex, expo, uh, complex conjugate. That's equal to the, the complex number itself, r times e to the i theta, and I take the complex conjugate, which would be r, it's still real number, times exponential of. Theta is also real, so nothing happens to it. I just replace this i with the minus i. Now, if you recall the exponential algebra, when you have e to the i theta, call this t, no, not t, call this x if you want, times e to the minus i theta, or minus x if you want, e to the x times e to the minus x, that's uh, uh, like e to the x divided by e to the x. So they will cancel out. This will cancel out with that, and it results in r squared. In some sense, this is a much simpler calculation than what you saw here, and the result is the same. And when you look at this and See, notice the property of exponential, where uh, whenever you do complex conjugate, then this exponential of x turns into exponential of minus x. You can see that in this representation, this represents the magnitude, uh, just uh, straight away, right away, without needing to do any complicated um, uh, operations. And this turns in, this is, uh, uh, this, uh, um, indicates only the direction, or I guess the uh, the direction is a bit misleading, or it's not quite what the the complex parameter means. It uh, more properly uh, described not as a direction, but as a phase angle. And phase as a concept is something that takes a bit of a time to fully understand, and um, I think uh, what I can say at this point is that um, the kind of the situations where you will need to deal with a phase um, is when you're dealing with oscillatory phenomena. And this is why complex exponentials become so useful when we are dealing with either oscillating LC circuit or, um, or oscillating RLC circuit or the driven AC circuit. In, in those scenarios, the representation of the phase angle is so naturally built into this uh, complex number representation. And, and uh, you can also you know, express that phase using what's called a phasor diagram. So, um, you know, when you look in your textbook in the section talking about uh, resistance and reactance and impedance and uh, kind of the relative phase of applied voltage and current, um, you see a, a two-dimensional uh, diagram, two-dimensional plane that's drawn and different vectors that are drawn on this, um, on the phasor diagram. And there is a one-to-one -one relationship between what you see as a phasor diagram in, in the textbook and um, um, representation of complex quantities, such as um, complex impedances on complex plane. And really the biggest advantage of working with the complex, uh, complex exponentials specifically is when you are working with the phasors, um, you have these quantities that naturally, uh, by its nature, has two degrees of freedom. That's uh, something that you are necessarily going to have 
when you are dealing with the quantities that can vary in length and that can vary in phase relationship to other oscillating quantities that you have. You are going to need to specify those with the two degrees of freedom. And when you use a phasor diagram, essentially what you are doing is you are using geometric reasoning. And in some sense, that geometric reasoning is intuitive. You can visualize it more easily. But it quickly runs into difficulties. For the same reason, I think a lot of people do better with the algebra than geometry, because uh, uh, geometry sometimes is <laughs> kind of difficult to follow in a sequential way. With algebra, the manipulation of symbols is sometimes easier than kind of a visual reasoning that you have to do with the geometry. So when you're dealing with a simple circuit, like a series RLC circuit, the phasor diagram, simple geometric reasoning, works very well. It, the advantage of the complex exponentials and the algebraic approach becomes more obvious as you start to deal with the more complicated circuits. Because um, once you train your skill at working through uh, complicated algebraic expressions, those are um, kind of easy to work through. You just follow the rules of algebra. And um, so with the complex exponentials, what we are doing is we are taking what is essentially a geometry problem and turning it into an algebra problem that uh, really is, um, makes it easier to uh, systematically approach things. Um, that's one. And two, which uh, you can see more, you can appreciate it a little bit better as you, um, as you work with the, the differential equations that describe the circuit, the equation of motion for circuit. Uh, the calculus portion becomes much easier when you are working with the complex exponentials. And it really comes from the special property of exponential functions. So, you know, when you are taking derivative of most any function, well, um, you can't really, you know, it's a, it's a different function. You have some formulas that will tell you how to get the different function, but um, you're going to have to find the different function. Now, when you're taking derivative of an exponential, it becomes exponentially easier. Sorry, sorry for the part. When you're taking derivative of an exponential, then you get the exact same function back. Um, uh, well, there's a, sometimes a chain rule you have to apply to get some quantities out in front. But when you are expressing your dynamical quantities, like a voltage, uh, as a, in terms of the exponential, a complex exponential, the kind of calculus that you would normally have to do becomes much simpler. Uh, so when you are working with the real value of functions, this would have been in terms of a cosine or sine function, where each derivative change what type of function is and potentially introduces minus sign. Um, when you're dealing with the exponential, you don't have, at least the, in the formalism, you don't have to worry about that. When you take the derivative of this with respect to t, then this outside the function doesn't change. You simply get um, v0 exponential of i omega t back. You have to remember to apply the chain rule to get this factor out. And the kind of the derivative you have to take is much simpler when you're dealing with the exponentials. So when you're, as you're dealing with the equation of motion, you will also see that uh, calculus becomes easier. This kind of a calculus problem, complex exponentials will turn that into an algebra problem. And um, you see that simplification when you watch in the lectures how we cover both the time dependent and AC circuits using complex impedances. So, so th this is an overview of the complex exponentials. Hope it's helpful. Hope this uh, um, reminds you of the things you've learned in your earlier math classes. And I strongly encourage you reviewing the Feynman lecture chapter uh, as a kind of a written overview review that leads to this introduction of uh, complex exponential um, in terms of the mathematical operations that 
um, that you've learned, uh, kind of the review of mathematical operations with um, more uh, added mathematical maturity that comes from your training? 